हरि ओम तत्सत वेलकम टू स्वामी ज्योतिर्मयानंद सोसाइटी अ जर्नी टू सेल्फ रियलाइजेशन प्लीज सब्सक्राइब फॉर द मिस्टिकल मीनिंग्स एंड टू एंजॉय डेली सत्संग वी आर करेंटली एक्सप्लोरिंग द बुक गुरु भक्ति योग ऑथर्ड बाय स्वामी शिवानंद जी महाराज नरेटेड बाय माय सेल्फ स्वामी निखिलानंद सो वी आर कंटिन्यूइंग आर ब्लिसफुल जर्नी ऑन द deeper understanding of the relationship between the guru and the disciple the intellect in most cases acts as a mere tool in the hands of buried instincts and desires so the intellect if it's not pure will make poor decisions the conscience of the individual speaks in accordance with his tendencies inclinations educational habits passions and the society in which he is placed the conscience of a savage speaks a language entirely different from that of a civilized uh, distinguished person the conscience of an african person speaks in a manner quite different from the one in which the conscience of an ethically developed yogi of india does there are cult- cultural differences space differences time differences the sense of duty ingrained in a clerk a car driver a scavenger a collector and a king is not the same there are 10 different conscience conscience in 10 different persons brought up in 10 different conditions therefore nature is um, infinite there are so many permutations and combinations virochan thought of himself quite guidance from his conscience acquired for himself and came to the conclusion that body is the ultimate self it should be remembered that the human consciousness is entangled in animal instincts emotions and gross desires the tendency of the mind of a man is to move in the direction of senses and ego and not towards higher knowledge so that's why the lower senses keep on pulling us downwards a complete surrender of personality to the guru who is endowed with the highest realization avoid such pitfalls on the path of sadhana and takes the aspirant safely to the light that shines beyond the darkness of samsara or world process human reason and human conscience act in the manner in which they are trained and as ordinarily they are accustomed to function in accordance with the laws of the appearance of the world and the objects of senses and of the cravings and the ambitions of the ego they cannot be expected to take one spontaneously to the higher realms of spiritual knowledge in other words it's an incremental improvement those who teach the theory that a guru is not necessary and that each one should follow one's own reason and conscience they forget the ostensible fact that they themselves take on the role of gurus to those whom they teach this doctrine they are trying to force their views and becoming a guru by telling people don't listen to gurus so this is the <laughs> predicament we are in they begin to command respect adorations and worship as great teachers though they teach that there is no need for a teacher we should know how the buddha for example asked his disciples to think for themselves rationally and convince themselves for themselves in regard to the validity of the doctrine which he preached and not to accept anything by mere authority of the word therefore this is a, a process of practice implementation practical experience he did not propound the worship of any god do however the result has been that he is being worshiped as a great guru and even a god the teaching in regard to thinking for oneself and the denial of the need for a guru naturally implies the acceptance on the part of the taught for a person who teaches as a guru it is found that the need for a guru cannot be overcome in any walk of life in every aspect you need teachers to guide you your first guru is your mother 
who feeds you, nurses you, dresses you, teaches you and takes you to school, then your father, then the guru, then your teachers and so on. It is the nature of human experience to get affected by a process of subject-object interaction. There is a feeling amongst people in the West that the dependence of the disciple on the guru is a psychological bondage which according to the theory of psychoanalysis has to be got over. In this connection, it has to be noted however that the relationship of the disciple to the guru is not the psychological dependence which psychoanalysis is familiar with but with the surrender of personality to the care of a higher consciousness, which includes and transcends the limited individualistic consciousness of the disciple, just like water flows downward, doesn't go back upwards. So the higher knowledge can satiate the lower knowledge or the disciples, the Guru's consciousness is fully enveloped in God and therefore they can direct that energy towards the disciple. Further, the disciple's dependence on the Guru takes the form of a personal relationship only in the beginning but in the end it becomes a veritable surrender of the individual to the universal. Guru's role is to show you your connection of Atma consciousness with God and that till then he is the Guru. Once that connection has been established, then the disciple himself becomes the Guru. He becomes the light and since he has received that light from his Guru, he continues to show respect to his Guru and gratitude to his Guru just as we all are feeling towards our own Guru, just like I feel towards our Guru Swami Jyotirmanandji Maharaj and the entire lineage of Swami Shivananda then all the way to Adi Shankaracharya Ji. It becomes a candle lighting the other. The Guru becomes a symbol of eternal. The patient's dependence on the psychoanalyst is no doubt a relationship from which the patient has to break himself away for this dependence is brought about temporarily for the sake of bringing about a relief of tension in the mind of the patient. However, when the task is done, the dependence is broken and overcome and the patient becomes free and independent as before. But neither in the beginning nor in the end, the relationship of the disciple to the Guru takes the shape of an undesirable dependence. So it's not like when somebody gets sick, they should see a Guru. When they get better, they should not. It doesn't work like that. It's a journey of faith and love. It is dependence on the universal through and through. The Guru is taken not as the body, or even as a personality, but as representation of the highest spiritual reality. So, don't confuse Guru with his looks or his accent or his <laughs> teachings, uh, the way he talks, but go after the real nectar of his spirit. Thus, the dependence of the disciple of the Guru on the Guru is a gradual process of self-purification on the part of the disciple and of his final attainment of the Supreme Godhead. So, the best, um, best Guru Dakshina gratitude a disciple can pay to the Guru is to become a Guru, teach, share freely selflessly, unselfishly and become part of the universe. There are some who often cite the instance of Yagyavalka's disassociation of himself from his guru Vaishyampayana as an indication even in ancient times of the possibility of one leading an independent spiritual life unrelated to any guru other than oneself. So here Swami Shivananda Ji is one by one removing the objections that people have to their limited thinking. It is true that Yagya Valkya disconnected himself from Vaishampayana, but this was not because he was not loyal to his Guru, 
but because the guru was enraged at him and asked him to quit his ashram after returning to him whatever knowledge he had imparted. Sometimes gurus do that when the disciples are unqualified or they become too arrogant. This of course created in Yagya Valkya a distrust towards all human gurus, but he did not give up his search for a guru. Instead of feeling that there is no need for having a guru and that one can proceed for oneself independently along the spiritual path, he resorted to a superior guru or the sun god himself. So this was Yagya Valkya's uh, journey. He ended up uh, and it is all destined, predestined and therefore um, there is this big stotra that Yagya Valkya ji had written, the same sage uh, when he guided Lord Rama when he was going to defeat uh, Ravana uh, and that is known as the Aditya Hridaya Stotram. Aditya means the sun god and this was given by sage Yagya Valkya because he had earned the uh, sun god became his guru. Also, sun god was the guru of Hanumanji also if you may remember. So thus, there is no argument whatsoever in the behavior of Yagya Valkya which can establish or demonstrate the undesirability of dedicating oneself to a guru. So that is important. And when Yagya Valkya acquired a fresh knowledge from the sun god, he was ready to impart it to other disciples previous and then requested the latter who is said to have been highly pleased later at the tremendous strength and aspiration and courage which Yagya Valkya revealed to propitiating the sun god. So even his guru who got angry at him and let him go was finally pleased to see uh, the ascension of his disciple. He wasn't jealous, he wasn't angry, he was happy that he found such a good higher guru in the sun god. So with this we conclude our satsang for today. We will continue this journey in tomorrow's satsang. Hari Om Tatsat.